We're delighted to see all the Elba people here. And this is our, I'm J.C. Argetsinger, president of the International Motor Racing Research Center. And we are delighted to welcome all of you to our opening day here, which is uh, our open house, which corresponds with the opening day of the racetrack at uh, Watkins Glen International. And we are thrilled to have the Elva reunion. Uh, Elvas and Watkins Glen go back a long time. And uh, perhaps we can get my brother Michael, who's going to be coming to the podium, to tell you a little story that he had in 1958 with, a, with an Elva. Uh, we, uh, we have a number of Elva owners, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment. But I have two special announcements. Uh, I would like to ask all of you to have a moment of silence uh, for Bob Youngdahl, a famous Elva owner, an uh, Elva Porsche owner, and a courier owner, who no doubt would have been here. But he did have a tragic accident uh, uh, loading one of his cars last month. And we have a book that we'd like you all to sign. Uh, we're going to send it to his family. And uh, also, I'd like to remind people this is Bill Milliken's 101st birthday. The last couple of years, we uh, had uh, a birthday celebration for Bill. Last year, at the 100th birthday, we had a huge crowd, and uh, he gave a fine talk. He was not able to be with us today, but uh, he is one of the great founders of the racing at Watkins Glen, and of course, famous uh, for many, many things, engineering, and for famous for naming Milliken's Corner in his Bugatti in 1948. But uh, I would like to ask for a moment of silence for uh, Bob Youngdahl. Well, thank you. Now, I know the Elva owners are going to be going up to the track a little later on, and uh, Randy Cook will be your uh, sergeant major. Randy, where are you? Right here. And uh, if you haven't met with him, he will... Uh, He'll escort you up to the track, and there's a secure place for you to put your cars. But I would like to uh, like to have the Elva owners who are here stand up. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, Gary uh, Crossaboom, are you here? Stand up. You're from Bridgeton, New Jersey. Thank you for coming up. And also, uh, Al uh, Shakoti. Al. Al. Very good. From Bennington, Vermont. Max Neal likes Vermont. Max, are you here? Max is a Vermont girl. Uh, Bob uh, Prescott from Pine Bush, New York. Bob, thank you for being here. Russ Mowry from uh, New Hampshire. Thanks, Russ. Charlie North, also from Vermont. Charlie. Andrew Rich from Massachusetts. Oh, my goodness. Maybe we should suspend here. But we'll, uh, we'll give them a recap. We'll give them a film here. Frank Kavanaugh is doing a wonderful job, and these discs are available uh, for people that uh, would like to see them afterwards. We have a full library of our lectures. We do, oh, four or five of these a year, and uh, some superb speakers. And, of course, we do have some superb speakers today. Also, Tim uh, Coons is here from Rochester, New York. Tim? And uh, Earl Tucker from New Hampshire. Earl, thank you for being here. We had several other people who, were, who had to cancel at the last minute, uh, car troubles and so forth, but this is a good representation of the uh, Elva people. But uh, I've said we've, we have two wonderful speakers here today. Well, we have, we have Giannis Wimfen, who is going, who's our major speaker, who has written the definitive book on the Alva, and we have them for sale at the uh, racing center across the street. Just a superb book. And we were able to coax uh, Bertie Martin to come out. Bertie, as you know, uh, is the great, uh, probably the greatest living ambassador for automobile racing. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, we do? Very good. Tucker, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. You know, that is the problem when you read a list and then you feel miss somebody. But thank you very much for pointing out. Yes, ma'am. Dave Wells from Rochester, New York. Dave, where's Dave? Dave, thank you. Well, Dave is a longtime supporter of the center, and I'm, I'm glad he's here today. I'm delighted he's here. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Now, what was the name, please? Well, there are more than I thought. Anyone else here, Nelva owner? 
Well, all right, Bertie. I, you know, well, <laughs> Bertie is the original Elv owner. You know, he was the original Elva distributor. And if you saw our last newsletter or saw Jonas's book, there is a spectacular picture of uh, Bertie with the Elva up on two wheels. And maybe he'll tell us what happened. It's frozen in, in time, and you wonder, did he write it back or did he roll it over? <laughs> but thank you, Bertie, and maybe, maybe you'll comment on that. <laughs> well, anyway, we, we have this wonderful speaker in this just incredible book. I didn't know that there could be so much material about Elvis. It was so informative and so well-researched. The photographs are just terrific, Jonas, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to see it. But I'm, I'm not going to say much about these uh, two gentlemen here because um, uh, Michael Argetsinger, the good-looking Argetsinger and the <laughs> racing Argetsinger, I'm uh, unfortunately the Argetsinger who was, had the black sheep of the family who was, had a nine-to-five job, and uh, uh, my brothers Michael and Peter have raced extensively. Michael has raced, uh, I probably shouldn't say this anymore because it kind of dates you, but he started when he was nine. He's raced for four and a half decades, and uh, I think he's raced at something like uh, uh, nine different countries, uh, seven different countries, 54 tracks, and over 400 races. And not only is he good looking and he's a great driver, but he has uh, uh, produced four wonderful books on the sport, starting with the Walt Hanskin book which really brings the story of road racing from its inception here in Watkins Glen after the war. And then he picks up uh, with his two books on Mark Donahue, which uh, Mark was a, a protege of, uh, of uh, Walt Hanskin, and Michael brings the story further. Now, our latest book from Michael, which he and David Bull Publishing uh, have, um, have given up any profit on it, and it's all for the profit of the Motor Racing Research Center, uh, it is the uh, story of the U.S. Grand Prix here at Watkins Glen from 1960, the 20 years through 1980. And that is also on sale over at the center. I don't want to make this sound like a PBS moment, but we are, are supported by enthusiasts like yourself. We receive no government or corporate uh, funding, and I look out there and I see many of our contributors, and that's what keeps us going. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Michael R. Argetson. Well, it's great to have a big brother who says nice things about you. That's a, a nice introduction indeed. I want to tell you what we're going to uh, talk about today, and then I'm going to introduce the speakers. Uh, first, I'd like to say, if you have a cell phone, if you could turn it off or put it on vibrate, it helps a lot, particularly for the recording we're doing of this event. And before I tell you about, about the program, I want to thank someone who isn't with us, but has been really helpful, extraordinarily helpful in putting this together, and that's Roger Dunbar uh, from the UK. He's uh, known to, to most of you, I believe. Uh, he really worked a lot behind the scenes, and he almost was able to make the trip. Jano Schwimpfen is going to talk a little more specifically about Roger, but Roger, thank you very much. Now, the program today it is really exciting, and I just feel terrifically honored to be introducing these two people who I, who I admire so much. Our keynote speaker is Janos Wimpfen, who has come from say, Seattle, and uh, Burdette Martin, Bertie Martin, as he, as he is known all over the world, uh, came out from Chicago. And I'm going to tell you both more about both of those men. The... Um, uh, Janos will keynote it. Bertie's going to come in a couple of times into the middle of the program, talk about uh, some of his involvement. Bertie also was the, the uh, in addition to having been the uh, original um, uh, Elva importer to this country, wore so many other hats in American racing. He was the series chief steward for the SCCA's Trans Am in its golden days, 1970, which was the seminal year for that. Um, later uh, was then the uh, series chief steward for the Can-Am, which we all dearly recall. This only touches on Bertie's life. Uh, from 1986, uh, from 1983 actually, to 2006, Bertie was the president of ACUS. ACUS is an acronym for Automobile Competition Committee of the United States. It's a tremendous honor to 
hold that position, but it's a really difficult uh, job to, to, uh, to maintain. Uh, the ACUS is the American delegate to the FIA. The FIA, as you know, doles out the international dates, makes all the rules. It's where it all emanates from. And America has many competing sanctioning bodies, but where they come together is in ACUS. They're all on the board, and they, with uh, a man like Bertie Martin, uh, there to keep them all talking to one another, the international dates and so many other things are doled out. Bertie's position uh, with his uh, uh, much-loved Anne, uh, who we dearly miss, uh, <clears throat> ran ACUS, and so many of you, if you applied for an international license during that period, or you worked with Anne and, and Bertie. Uh, but Bertie was uh, chief steward at many of the World Grand Prix around the world, uh, he was um, uh, active in, in Paris. Uh, on the FIA itself, he was, a vi he was vice president of the FIA, in addition to being president of the American delegation. And he was, in fact, the longest serving vice president uh, that the FIA has ever had. Uh, he also headed up the International Records Commission. And, and the FIA is the ultimate verifier, if you will, uh, of, of land speed records. Uh, speed records in general, and Bertie was president of that, that commission. Again, uh, he was founding member, too, of the, um, uh, one of the founding members of the FIA Trust, and uh, now we say chief steward, in Europe they say clerk of the course, but as I mentioned, many, many of the World Formula One Grand Prix, and of course, Bertie operated during that period when Formula One was in a dynamic period. It was a, it was a time of great change, of great controversy, uh, we were so fortunate as Americans to have someone who has the wit, the charm, and the negotiating abilities to keep these very difficult groups of people all agreeing to do the right thing. And so we're going to hear from Bertie in, in, in just, a, um, just a few minutes, and it's going to be a delight. Our keynote speaker will be an equal delight. Janos Wimpfen is one of America's great researchers in the world of motorsport, researchers and writers. He has been a prolific writer, and that's really something, to have published as many books as Janos has published, because his books are incredibly well researched. They're in depth, they're respected worldwide. Uh, he has, uh, his background is, uh, is a PhD, and he's, a, he's an academic, but really he's a, he's a racer at heart, and, and uh, he is known and, and admired around the world. Uh, he's a third generation car guy, uh, a member of a historic uh, Austro-Hungarian family. Uh, Janos came here at about age four. So he is uh, also, uh, in addition to his love of motorsports, he's a real baseball nut. Uh, Janos has been to more minor league ballparks around America and I think all but maybe one or two major league parks. And even on this trip, he's already got to the Syracuse Stadium and the, uh, and the uh, I believe, the Buffalo one. So he, he never misses a chance. He loves minor leagues equally with the majors. Uh, interesting family. His grandfather uh, held the Austrian driver's license number one. So uh, uh, in, in, in fact, in, in taking the test, he had to give the instructions to the Vienna policemen because they had no idea what they were examining. Uh, he really is, uh, uh, he, he learned great in engineering skills from his father and, and man mechanical aptitude from his brother. And he did some club racing. And he says that taught him he didn't have driving skills of Austrians such as Lauda and Rint, but we could all say that we didn't have talents like, us, like Lauda and Rint. Uh, he has uh, been consulting all over the country uh, in addition to his writing. He's a consultant uh, regularly in, in Naples, Florida for the Collier Museum, uh, for the Bruce McCaw Collection, uh, and others. And he is sought after by uh, car owners and uh, historians uh, literally all over the world. I uh, am, am very proud to uh, be a friend of Janos's as well as uh, a fellow author, and we share the same publisher, 
David Bull Publishing. And we were together in Beverly Hills this past December at the Peterson Museum for the Motor Press Guilds Award, the Dean Bachelor Award. And uh, David Bull, to his great credit, had two of the three finalists, and the winner was Janosch. And it's his book, which is still brand new, that's available. If you haven't picked up a copy, buy it today because he is here to personalize it for you. Uh, I really have so much more to say about both of these men, but you really want to hear them. So I am going to ask Janosch to come to the podium. Thank you very much, both to Michael and JC. In fact, uh, JC's little issue there with having additional Elva owners is, is uh, I'm so familiar with that syndrome that you, you work hard on something and then when it's actually out there, all of a sudden more information comes your way. It's always actually a pleasure rather than a problem. Uh, in fact, of course, here it's a pleasure that we have additional Elva owners. Um, sometimes, I, I found that from the very first book that I did, which is called Time in Two Seats, that once I finished that and people started coming forward, well, you either got this wrong or you forgot about this or here's some additional information on this or that race. The first time that happened to me, I was kind of a little discouraged, like, oh, did I drop the ball here or something like that. And, and more often than not, I would be comforted by other people saying, no, 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 you got it all right, but just... Next time around, here's a little extra added information. And, and that's interestingly part of this, this whole process, process of discovery, I call it. Um, I get asked a lot about sort of the writing process and the creative process, publishing process. All these have a, a lot of little nuances to them, which I can go on for hours. It's just maybe a separate topic altogether. But I think at the, at the core of this is really the, the joy of learning. Just like those little tidbits that come to you after the fact, I've, I've learned that what really is, is the joy of that is you learn something new. There's no such thing as an old dog doesn't learn new tricks. We, that's how we enjoy getting older is learning more each day. And hopefully that gets incorporated into these books. It certainly is the case with Elva. I didn't know much about Elva to start with. I know a lot more now. There's still a lot more to know about it. This morning, people were coming up to me and giving me extra little bits, whether it was about their car or in interesting tidbits they accumulated that I didn't know about. Well, I learned that this morning. It's always a process of learning. The other kind of maybe issue of, of that sometimes maybe many of the people here in the room are concerned about is why do we do what we do? that is, have an interest in motorsport history, and is it really worthwhile? After all, it's not rocket science. We're not discovering a cure for some disease, something like that. How important is it to society? Well, true, it doesn't rank up with some of those other very valuable enterprises that people undertake. But it is important when you think that the automobile is the 20th century's most significant technological achievement. It changed everything. From the 19th century to 20th century, it was a sea change. Most of that came about because of the automobile. Not all of it good, mind you. There were utopias and dystopias created at the same time. And in some small way, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at that history of that 20th century and the most significant part of it. We're looking at it from the motorsports point of view, particularly from the recreational element of it, which is a major part of automotive history, was how it was used as a recreational tool. And that's not insignificant, but it's also important to have fun while we're doing it. And, of course, we're all having fun while we're doing it. This is, by the way, a conversation I often have with a friend of mine in the U.K., Doug Nye, who you may know of his books. He's also a very well-known historian, motorsport historian. And he, whenever we, we sometimes share a podium and, and talk about these sorts of things, and his sort of thing is, well, we in, in England don't do this kind of navel-gazing. We just get on with it have a lot of fun, and, and he's got a, a really good point about that. Just one, one other comment about um, the creative process in general, and we'll get to the meat of the talk here. And that, and this is again because I, I periodically get asked this sort of thing about, well, how do you do these things anyway? I don't know if this would apply to Michael as well, his creative process. 
but the in in just like in any enterprise that you undertake any kind of work you hit roadblocks you hit problems you go how do I write this next paragraph this next chapter in my case it's usually the next caption to a photo those are to me are always challenging and you hit roadblocks and sometimes you you want to practice iron discipline I'm going to sit here at the keyboard until I get this right just like you practice sometimes iron discipline at fixing the leak in the uh, in the kitchen sink that you're going to get it done now, no matter what happens. And what often happens is you break, the, you break the, the nut or whatever it is, or you're working on a car, you break the nut off rather than accomplish it. So you have to sort of step back from that. And I kind of call it the pleasure principle of creativity. Um, I under I've only lately learned that there's actually a neuroscientific aspect to this. I don't know all the details of that, but that is that. You have to step back and do something that's ultimately very pleasurable, that doesn't involve a lot of a lot of brain activity necessarily. Necessarily relax and let the creative process flow through you. Let the two things connect that have never connected before. My per personal preference in that is a morning shower. Think of how many times in the shower in the morning. You might be dwelling on what you have to do that day, but it's a very pleasurable moment. Nobody's bothering you. You're by yourself. You get to think about what you're doing during the day, and you inevitably connect two dots that have never been connected before about your particular problem of the day. I use that a lot in the creative process. The day before, I'm stuck on some paragraph. The next morning in the shower, I go, oh, that's a solution to that. Sometimes I, by the time I get to the pad of paper, I've forgotten what it was. But, but, but that's very much part of the creative process. And like I say, I understand from neuroscientists that there's actually a part of the brain that goes into play at those times and works on connecting those dots. The publishing process is a different sort of thing because that involves a lot of give and take. And Michael, as Michael mentioned, he and I are really, truly privileged to share what I consider absolutely the best publisher in, in the world as far as motor, motor racing, motorsports books, and that's David Bull. David is, I think Michael has maybe a little different relationship with him than I do. David is very exacting, and he and I have had years and years of debates, just hours and hours worth of debates about how to do sometimes literally a particular sentence, position a photograph, something like that. And there's a lot of give and take on that, but at the end of the day, the product wouldn't be the product without somebody like David Bowen. A lot of tribute to him. A quick tribute to a couple of people that I've gotten to know, uh, particularly here in the center, because this is not the first time I've been to the center. First time I think I've spent three days here, but uh, I'm not, I've been to the center before. I think there's people like Bill Green, who has just been a marvelous in terms of helping me put together a lot of the data that goes into this. I've been privileged to meet people like Max, Misha, Randy, Kevin, Josh, Glenda, all the other people involved in this center. You have a treasure here that's amazing. A treasure not only in the facilities, but a treasure in terms of the people that are here. They're, they're a marvelous group of people that are really committed and do a good job. That people thing is also, by the way, something that I think drives a lot of this history. Yes, the history of motorsports and, and, and automotive history in general is one about lug nuts and torque settings and carburetors and the like, but it's really about the people. They're, on all of this, the histories of the people involved, people like Bertie Martin sitting here and characters left and right are really what this history is ultimately about. That's what we carry on in the next generation to tell the stories of the people who were involved. There were good people, not so good people, characters of all sorts. And, and in all the, the work that I've done, I've discovered I go into it with sort of a nuts and bolts approach. And at the end of the day, come out of it, no, the respect is really for the people. As for Elva, why Elva? Well, maybe a little bit of an introduction to Elva for those of you. I know there are many Elva owners here who know it in many cases better than I do. But for those of you who may not be familiar with the Elva mark, Elva was a British mark 
that existed for a very short period of time, from roughly 1955 to roughly 1965, although there's a little bit of, of fading in and fading out before and after that, but really for a short period of time. It was a contemporary of other makes such as Cooper, Lotus, Lola, particularly those and a few others, uh, rival to those. It came out of a particular milieu of the early 50s British scene when there was a, there, the economy in Britain wasn't that strong, but the, the technology was there, and again, in terms of the people, there was a lot of expertise into how to go about things. And we'll see a little bit about that. And uh, that's a, a kind of an, an, just a very, very overview, short overview of what Elva is as a mark. It's a unique mark. In many ways, it's both unique and it's also typical. It's typical of that time in England, of different automobile constructors, most of them call it manufacturers. But it's also unique because it has its own particular peculiarities. I came into this project actually somewhat later down the line. I didn't originate the project. The project was originated by two fellows, one of which mentioned before, Roger Dunbar in, the Engl in England, and Jeff Allison in Colorado. They had undertaken to produce the history of Elva um, and did an amazing amount of legwork. They, they interviewed many of the key people. Thankfully, they interviewed some of the key people who are no longer with us. Uh, and before and, and passed away before I got involved in the project. They did a lot of the kind of nuts and bolts work involved in getting the information. And, uh, but they did, never got around to actually writing it. So I came in, I was asked to write the actual, do the writing of the book, which of course then, as I said before, got me involved in learning as to what Elva was. I mean, I had a rough idea before, but the learning, the real nuts and bolts of Elva and sort of took it over from there. So with that, we'll talk about, don't turn on it. Elva really is the one person, there's really one person behind Elva more than anybody else, and that's Frank Nichols. Um, Frank grew up in Sussex County, south of England. He was the son of a grocer, as you see here. He was in the Army in World War II, served in El Alamein, uh, was injured in El Alamein, and worked to a large extent as gained a lot of mechanical skills during the war and brought those back to England after he mustered out. That's Frank on the, on the uh, left-hand side, I'm sorry, the right-hand side of the photo. His brother John on the left-hand side, the friend in between is unidentified. Uh, Frank is, and Sussex is in the, so he's in the south of England, Bexhill is the name of the village, which is very close to Hastings, where William the Conqueror landed in 1066, so kind of a historic area. Also historic automotively, that's where the, one of the very first automotive competitions took place in England in 1903. So he mustered out of, out of the uh, military, out of the army, and quickly developed an interest in automotive things because, as I say, he developed the skill. He opened up a garage repairing cars called the London, uh, the London Road Garage on London Road in Bexhill, and quickly became interested in racing. And this was where I would say Elva is a common, this is a common occurrence that time in England. Young men develop mechanical aptitude during the war, now have a little bit of spending money, maybe develop a, some kind of an enterprise related to automobiles, and get interested in motor racing. Frank did that. He drove a Ford 10, which is a very common car of that era in racing. He also drove a Lotus 6, a Lotus 6 with a Ford 10 engine in it. Modest success. His driving skills were never that particularly great. But he quickly became involved with a fellow named Mac Witts and also indirectly with Harry Wesley, who you may know the name from uh, a lot of automotive development in the 1960s. They developed a very unique power plant 
or part of the power plant. In addition to the, uh, oops, in addition to the, uh, the Ford 10, a hop-up kit, if you will, an inlet over exhaust valve kit that you could put on the top of the Ford engine and increases power a little bit. And as a result of this, he also decided, well, I should really commission a car to go with this inlet over outlet head. And that was called the CSM, the Chapman Sports Motor Car. This is a one-off car that was built, and that was the, the cars that you saw in the earlier shots were the, the CSM Special. And the CSM Special was quite fast, again, because of his driving, he didn't necessarily win a lot of races, but was lightning fast, attracted a lot of attention. People want to know, well, uh, how, can we get, how can we get the same thing? So he ended up going into business selling those kits that you saw, the inlet over exhaust kits. And those actually became a mainstay of the company for a number of years. They were sold up until roughly 1960, 61, about the time that that engine, the Ford 10, was really became obsolete, no longer used. But they were popular, sold all over the world. This particular example is a, a car in New Zealand that used that head. So the heads were found all over the world. Not yet Elva. The, the term Elva really wasn't born yet at this point. But of course, people liked this concept, and and um, they wonder, well, where where can we get one of these? So he decided to go into production, actually producing the Elva, what became known as the Elva. Well, the Elva name initially was just going to be the the LRG car for London Road Garage, not a very pleasant name. But at one point, he had this friend Bill Murphy, and his brother Bill, Jim Murphy. Bill's brother Jim looked at the car one day and said, Elva, the French for she goes. And then it was contracted to ELVA, and thus we forever have the name Elva. This was actually the, the first of these Elvas. Fairly crude, almost cycle fender car, fairly crude car. It was very much, again, the, the image of that era. Kind of a kit car, but now becoming a little bit more sophisticated. Orders came in fairly quick on this. That this was indeed a very successful car, was successful at this point no longer for Frank Nichols because he was out of driving himself. It was taken over by people such as this. This is Richard Mannering, a fellow who was tragically killed in the tourist trophy in an Elva. It was actually the first of, I believe, four fatalities to ever in an Elva. The, um, so now the orders began to expand. This is Frank Nichols again on the left. That's um, uh, Keith Marsden on the right who became a very, very critical player in this. I can't recall now who's in the center, but that's one of the drivers of that era who drove for Frank Nichols. And this is, as you might also see, there's another innovation here on this car, and that is a fiberglass body. Not all of the early Elvis had fiberglass. Many of them were aluminum. But that was, a, again, kind of an innovative concept at the time. Now, this innovation wasn't really, Frank wasn't trying to be technically advanced. He was always looking at everything from a price point of view. And that's actually one of the things that sets Elva apart from some of his contemporaries, Lola, Lotus, Cooper, and the like. He, Frank was this kind of a stingy sort of fellow, and he liked to build things to cost. Uh, the others, Lotus, typically would maybe sometimes were only would be going for speed. And consequently, the Lotus cars were famous for being Difficult to drive. All those were something easy that you could get into right away. But because of this kind of stinginess, uh, there were several factors about this. One of them was that there were no, never any Elva factory racing teams or really nothing that you could really directly point to an Elva racing, factory racing team. There was adequate servicing. In fact, he was known for being very good with communicating with the, the purchasers out there. Also that um, 
there, the technical advances were kind of slow in coming. It was only, it was, it was many, many years before he would introduce things such as disc brakes. Uh, but everything was always, was kind of focused on this price point point of view. There was also another important element, and this is more of external matters than internal. The market, the home market in England was never particularly strong, or at least not strong in the early years. And this is also coincided with the Suez Canal crisis when there was particularly a clamp in, in, in the English economy. So it became a period of export or perish. In order for any small manufacturer, small constructor like Elva to survive, they really had to export. Quickly looked at the American market. Well, one of the benefits is that the car got really good reviews in the English press. And of course, the English press was fairly widely read, or at least read as a cult matter in the US. And one of the people that picked up on that was a fellow named Chuck Dietrich out of Sandusky, Ohio. Chuck bought one of the first Elvas into the US, not, one of the, not necessarily the very first one, but one of the first in North America, at least. And this is Chuck racing at Putin Bay and Island in Lake Erie. And he became quickly one of the champions of Elva. For years and years, he was one of the main importers, and there are actually many importers and dealers, and like it's a very convoluted story in that regard. But he became one of the many uh, uh, people involved in this early stage, one of the key people. Chuck actually stayed with the mark for many, many years. In most cases, he was actually the, imported the very first of each of the successive models. He did later on sort of veer away and took a little vacation, drove a Bobsy for a while, and then returned again to Elva in later years. He was a very key figure in the early part of this. Another key figure who you'll meet in a moment here will be Bertie Martin. But before Bertie, there's also Frank Bike, who had one of the early, there's, there's, there's our, our friend Bertie in, in the car at his home. Um, Frank Bike was also one of the early ones, and he had a very unusual car. This was a car that had a V8 and a Chevy V8 crammed into this. My understanding is the car went great in a straight line, but not much else. Um, there were all kinds, and that was another thing about Elvis, there were always all kinds of experimentation that went on. We're moving now kind of into the Mark II era of, of the Elva, and as you can see, it's starting to get a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more sophisticated. Didion suspension comes into play. Uh, this particular car still has the wire wheels on it, but the black, there's, you'll see shots of these very distinctive Elva black mag wheels that are now coming into play. They remain distinctive for Elva for years to come. It's also, but another thing about these cars is that when we talk about these changes in design and all that, all this was done in a very, very kind of intuitive way. Keith Marsden, who was the main designer you saw in that earlier shot, he basically just drew chalk lines on the floor and that's what the chassis was built around. There were no drawings, no, certainly no CAD, CAD, CAD uh, computer-aided design kind of thing in those days, nothing of anything from more modern period. In fact, Keith Marsden is kind of an interesting character in and of himself because he uh, really enjoyed this kind of work. And in later years, when a company called Trojan, who we'll meet in a mo moment here, a company called Trojan came into play and took over some of the Elva production, and it became more of a corporate environment. Didn't suit Keith Marsden particularly well, and he left it, the company at that point. But he was a critical factor in these early days. And to give you a little bit of a flavor of what this is like, um, a little bit later in this particular photo, um, a fellow out of Washington, D.C., Walter Dixon, becomes involved with the, uh, with the Elva Enterprise and with somewhat chaotic results at that point. But in, when he became involved, he sent one of his people over, Arthur Tweedale, who himself was an expatriate Brit, back over to England to have a look at the Elva factory and report back as to what it was like. And so Tweedale goes over there and comes back and reports to his boss Dixon and said, well, you know, there's a couple welding torches over there and there's a couple guys assembling things over here and there's a radiator guy over here and the uh, engine guy pulling in the engines over here and somehow in the middle of this the cars just happen. 
And that's sort of very typical of this. And sort of another side of this, which is also so typically English, uh, uh, Michael had uh, not mentioned this, but when we were, Michael and I were in Los Angeles back in December, we were uh, very happy to be interviewed by Jay Leno on his website, uh, and not on his TV show, but on his website. And in part of that, Jay had a lot of comments. In fact, in the segment where he interviews me, these comments didn't quite make it into the final cut. But it's funny because Jay started telling stories, as only Jay Leno could, about his own experiences with English manufacturers and stuff. And he said, like, he understood when I would point out these things about how quirky the English are about things. He goes, oh, yeah, well, one time I had to, I had to call over there for some parts for one of his cars. And he said, oh, we're kind of busy. They said over there, we're kind of busy right now. Could you call back later? And, and he's thinking, oh, like, you know, Thursday or Tuesday or something like that. And, and, I, and he said, well, when should I call back? He said, well, maybe next November. <laughs> and that's so typically English. And then he would go over and visit. And he goes, yeah, there's a tea kettle here, and they're too busy having tea to bother with things like getting to your part right away. Or another, another instance like that where he called over for some part, and they said, oh, no, we don't make that part anymore. I says, well, why not? I says, we were getting so many orders for that, it was such a bother that we just, we just stopped making the part. And I thought, what could be more English than this? And this, this suffuses so much of, of Elva history. And um, so the Mark II things are getting a little bit more sophisticated, but it's still very much the intuitive chalk marks kind of thing. As I mentioned, there's all kinds of characters that come into play. And, and also, for, uh, one of the things here is the engine Type. So I mentioned earlier on that the Ford engine was kind of commonly used on the very early Elvis. That changed fairly, fairly quickly because really the engine to have in those days was the Coventry Climax FWA, featherweight uh, Coventry Climax 1100cc engine. That was really the thing to have. And so most of the, after a while, these Mark IIs and the like, most of them came with the Coventry Climax engine. There were all kinds of variants in there. A couple of people had a Maserati and had a few Alfa Romeos and like, but the Coventry Climax became sort of the, the, the common, most common thing. Well, one of the problems with the Coventry Climax was that at that point Lotus was also becoming a big power. And Lotus kind of tried to put, Lotus was a competitor to, to Alva, and they were trying to put a kind of the gabosh on Alva getting, on anybody else getting the Coventry Climax. So Frank Nichols had to look around for other suppliers. And one of the people he came to talk to was a fellow by the name of Archie Butterworth, who's one of the most colorful characters in this whole story. Archie um, also, by the way, learned many of his skills during the war. This, by the way, is Chuck Dietrich in this particular shot. But, uh, but turning back to Archie Butterworth, he also learned a lot of his skills in a very unusual way during World War II. He was in charge of inventorying and studying captured material from the enemy. And so by studying these, you, of course, then be able to give information back to his superiors as to how to maybe better improve the British armaments. And at one point there, uh, wherever, I don't know where this particular base was he was working at, he was um, sifting through some of the material and a German bomber came over and started strafing the, uh, that area. And in typical British fashion, he goes, oh, this is so bloody annoying. And he's scrambling around, reaches down, picks up this Luger that's lying on the ground, points the Luger up at the belly of the plane, boom, shoots it, and down comes the plane, and for which he won several awards, several, uh, several awards for that. So that's the kind of character was, he was. Later on, when he became involved in automotive things, he built, he had good mechanical abilities, built a really interesting car with an interesting engine, handled like garbage, and he ended up selling that car to Bill Milliken, who we heard about before, revered Bill Milliken here. Bill basically bought that car as a good study of what not to do, so he learned that from Archie Butterworth. Um, Archie also had a, was known for carrying a fully stocked bar in the boot of his Jaguar and would, first thing he'd do when he'd arrive at a race circuit would be to, of 
course, open that up. Uh, this early period here, by the way, I, I love this shot because it's something you'd never do with a vintage car these days, right? But back in those days, Mark III Alva, no problem. You'd run it in something like an autocross. This is a typical English autocross of the era where you'd run through the dirt and all that, pounding through the dirt. You don't care. It's just, a, it's just the race car of the day. So at, at this point now, we're, we're still kind of early in the Elva history. They've really only produced a few hundred cars. Many of them now are coming to the U.S., though. That's a big, big part of the market. Coming to the U.S. and Canada, this particular shot is from near me, and I like this one because it also is emblematic of the era. This happens to be from Westwood, the racing circuit in British Columbia. Here's Ron Mosscrop in a very early Elva, zipping by this fellow in the shorts, no shirt on. Try doing that today. Uh, but that's also emblematic of a very, very different time of racing. So there's still very few cars, but now we've got a couple of Americans have become deeply involved in this. I mentioned Chuck Dietrich. Another fellow was Carl Haas, very, very major player in this. He became an importer in, in Midwest. And another fellow is Bertie Martin. And since Bertie is here, I'll let Bertie talk about his particular era in, in, as far as Elva goes. Janos's uh, speech and talk here was so interesting. I'd like to rush through what I'm going to say to hear more about what he has to tell about. But I, I've got a few little comments I have to make. And I was reminded today uh, of something that uh, Chris Economaki told me one time when he was hired to do one of his first major race uh, uh, events. And uh, he was looking forward to it and he'd studied, you know, what talk about and so forth and uh, so as they came on the air the other uh, man that he was working with I don't recall who which one it was but he was a well-known sports announcer and play-by-play -play man and so forth and they started off and this other fellow said Chris tell me what are we going to see here today and Chris said well he went into the study he had done he said well you're going to see They've just changed the ride height on these cars. They've done some other things here to allow more fuel consumption uh, or, or less fuel consumption. He said, uh, we've got some new drivers here. Uh, he went on and named a number of things that would happen. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, technical people said, cut, cut. And... Uh, Chris said, what's that? He said, well, that we're, we're just doing a preview of the opening of it. That was just it. But we're now ready to go on live. So let's go back and start again. So the fellow comes on, who's the network announcer. Didn't know very much about motorsport, but he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're here today, and we're going to see these cars are running with new fuel rules on it, and they've got this, and they've got that. And they've got everything, and he repeated everything that Chris Economac, he had said in the warm-up. And then he turned to Chris and he said, now, Chris, what do you think? Chris told me I didn't know what to say at all. So that's kind of the way I feel right now. I think, Janos, you've told a lot of good stories here that I might have been counting on, but that's, there's a lot of them. With Elva and Nichols and uh, so forth, there's a lot of them. Also, I have to say, uh, after I heard... Uh, uh, Michael introduced us, and uh, JC and Michael introduced us. I thought, geez, I, I wish I could go and listen to those two guys. They must know what they're <laughs> talking about. So anyhow, no, I, I was very fortunate. I lived in a great era. I was 21 years old in a great era and a great team, great time to be living in motorsport and so forth. And uh, I look out, and I think these are Elva people. I don't remember Elva people looking this old, <laughs> you know, because we dealt with guys that couldn't afford a Lotus at the time, and maybe they could deal, they could get a uh, Elva or something, and they were all pretty much younger guys just starting out, 
and uh, when uh, many of them went a long way too. Unfortunately, we've lost many of them recently years. Recent years. Uh, I I have the excuse that <clears throat> I'm it's going to be in a couple months here. I'm going to be 83 years old, and. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, uh, I, I feel very good. I feel my health feels very good. My doctors tell me I'm pretty good and so forth. And uh, I hope to be around a good bit more because I really have had a wonderful period in my life here. Uh, not many people can spend every day working on their passion, which is motorsport and cars and people. And that gets to another important part of it, people, and that's that's what it's all about. And the Elva people were very unique. They were very quite different than people that bought lotuses and that. And a few of the people that bought lotuses swung over and bought Elvas and that. And uh, they didn't have the, the same engineering and the same uh, background as Lotus might have had. But uh, it was interesting. I, I have to touch a bit on, on Frank Nichols, too. Uh, you went into his youth and so forth, but uh, I was over in uh, England in 1953, right after uh, the war was over, and uh, I visited some of the people over there. In fact, I bought an engine at, in Italy for a friend and did a few things, and I visited with John Cooper, and uh, at that time, I, I met John, and I believe I met Frank at that time, but I didn't make a big impression because I didn't know he didn't have an Elva name on him or anything, but we referred back to that time. I did remember, though, at that time that uh, John Cooper said to me, I want to show you something. We just got the first one, and it was the FWA Coventry Climax engine, and he just had gotten the first one, and as most of you all know, that was really a variation from a water pump that was developed during the war during the Battle of Britain and so forth. And it was a very light engine for a pump that could really put out some water, and it was very effective. And that's why they built an overhead cam-type engine for it and that. And uh, he showed me that engine, and little did I know how, how much that would be a part of my life in a few more years because I ended up being a distributor for not only the Elva but for Coventry Climax parts and so forth. And I uh, even had Weber carburetors at one time, too. Uh, I started my own racing in, uh, well, actually in 1947, in the very early years, right after the war. Uh, Andy Granatelli in Chicago, where I lived in that era. Uh, Andy uh, uh, formed a group called the Hurricane Hot Rod Association. I had one of the first hot rods in Chicago, 32 high boy uh, uh, Ford, and uh, uh, so I joined that, and Andy was a great politician um, and so forth. He got us an opportunity to run at Soldier's Field in Chicago, and even got us a thousand dollar purse to run there, and uh, it turned out that this hot rod racing really, really caught on. In that first race at Soldier's Field, we had 40,000 people attend. And they probably paid a dollar and a quarter or something to get in, but the, the promoter made an awful lot of money. And I can tell you that the second time we raced there, we raced for 20, uh, we got 40% of the gate. And he, Andy learned that very quickly. And that was kind of an uh, interesting thing. I went off to college and First day I got down in Albuquerque, I was going to the University of New Mexico. I walked down the street and uh, I went by a garage and it had a midget racer inside there. Well, I went in and I told him that I was a great hot rod racer from Chicago and uh, so forth. And uh, I found out these fellas had just bought this uh, midget and uh, they didn't have a driver yet. So I got a job driving while I was in college there, drove for them for about a year or so. And uh, I remember the first time we went out to test. And I, I knew that you held the brake on on a, on a midget until they pushed you off and you, your wheels were locked up and 
once it got moving a bit, you take the brake off. And I knew all that so that it looked like I knew what I was doing. I made about two laps and spun. And uh, I came in, and they said, what happened? And I said, well, you know, I'm used to driving on blacktop. I'm not a dirt driver, really. And so I got by that. And I had, had a lot of fun. Was Actually, I made some money while I was going to college. And, of course, I couldn't tell my parents that I was making this kind of money because uh, 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 they wouldn't like the idea that I was driving race cars, and I hadn't told them that yet. But anyhow, they eventually accepted it all. In fact, they went to one of my first races in a sports car. I bought an MG TC and uh, uh, went to a race up at Wilmont Hills, which was a brand-new facility they had just bought in the, or had ran and leased it for a number of years. But anyhow, uh, uh, I drove the TC in the race. I think I finished back about fourth or fifth or something. And uh, I broke my tail driving that car as hard as I could. And I got home, and my father said to me, he said, son, he said, I like the way you drive. You're very consistent, and you're not rushing at all. And I thought, <laughs> there's something wrong about this, because I was trying awful hard. Well, anyhow, Frank Bike was one of my very good friends. We went to high school together and so forth, and uh, he was a very close friend. And uh, Frank was very mechanically inclined and uh, very, very handy in the shop, and he did machining, he did designing and everything else. He came from a family that produced candy, <laughs> and they were a very famous family in the Chicago area, maybe around the country in those days, the Whiz Bar, which was a chocolate marshmallow candy and that. But he was very good at things. And he had picked up an a, uh, Austin engine. I think it was an A40 or something like that, Austin engine. And he was doing a complete job on it, porting it and everything else. And uh, I said, Frank, what are you going to do with, the, with it? He said, well, he said, I've seen an ad or a little article in a in a magazine, a British magazine, and there's an Elva car there. And he said, I think maybe that's something I could use to, to put it into. In fact, I'm not sure it even had the name Elva yet. And uh, so uh, I said, geez, that sounds interesting. So uh, I said, let me go. I'll write a letter back to them and give me the address. And he did. And so I wrote back and wrote to Frank Nichols, and he sent me some stuff. And on, it, on the car, and uh, I said, why don't we buy that, and then we'll buy another complete car with an engine in it, and so I wrote back to Frank Nichols, and Frank said, uh, listen, we just got the first of these Coventry Climax engines, and he said, this is the hot setup. Do you still Are you still interested in two cars? I said, yeah, but one of them won't, we don't need an engine for. We just need the one. And he said, but you're going to buy two? I said, yes. In the article, we're back and forth. And he said, in those days, we sent telegrams, too, you know. And uh, he came back, and he said, uh, you're buying two, so you're now the dealer for that area. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I, uh, I got a hold of him. He told me that he had dealt with, with, uh, with uh, Chuck Dietrich. And I knew Chuck because I had raced MGs against him and, and uh Susie is his wife and that. And so uh, I said, that's great. Uh, uh, I, I'm happy. We'll work together on this, and I'll help, and we're going to get some parts and stuff in and so forth. And Chuck was a good friend and, uh, we, and, it, and a very accomplished driver, very, very good. And uh, the market area in Chicago uh, at that point, economy was pretty good and so forth. Uh, was a lot better than it was in Sandy and Sandusky, Ohio, where Chuck was located. So I think we sold a lot more cars, and we, uh, he did a lot more racing. The problem for me was when these two cars came over and you saw the one that Frank Bike ended up putting the Chevrolet engine in and took five years to finish it, but anyhow, that one. And the other one that they showed a picture, and that was in front of Frank Bike's home, and uh, uh, when it arrived, Frank Nichols came over at the same time to the United States, and he was going to visit us and visit somebody in Texas that had been writing to him. 
And uh, so we arranged to uh, meet Frank at the airport in uh, New York when it arrived. And we picked up that uh, car the night or so before and got it loaded in, on a trailer and so forth. And uh, we went and we met him at uh, the airport. And he said, uh, I'm going to Texas, and then I'm going to come back to you all because you'll be on the road going back to Chicago with this. So he said, could you take me over to uh, Newark Airport? And I said, sure, that's no problem. We can do that. So we went over to Newark Airport, and we were asking a lot of questions about what was happening in the racing scene. And, and believe me, in, in, in England, the uh, 1100 or what G modified, we called here in the United States, was a hot class over there. I mean, they had the, the future race drivers driving in that. So uh, we we're talking <laughs> about the racing, and <clears throat> waitress comes back and brings the wait the uh, the uh, uh, breakfast that we had, and Frank got his grapefruit, and it had a sparkler sticking in it, and it was glowing like this. And I always remember that because. <laughs> Frank said, I really didn't, I really don't know. He said, is this how you eat grapefruit over here? Because <laughs> this was really, other than his war ventures, which I don't think got him to very many nice restaurants, uh, he hadn't really been in a place that was a little fancy. So anyhow, we did that. Frank came back from Texas. I don't think he was terribly successful with that uh, venture. But anyhow, he came back and we met him in Chicago. And... Uh, we had a great time with Frank. He was, there's something, Frank, you know, we talk about what he was able to do and what he did. He wasn't really a great engineer, but he was capable. But he didn't reckon that he was an engineer anyhow. He figured that somebody they will you know, have to hire or use who he already has. But there was something about Frank that you had confidence in him that he could do what he was saying he was going to do. And he had plans. He wanted to run right up there with Lotus and with Cooper and so forth. And I have to tell you, even in his greatest success, uh, well, Colin Chapman, I think, was, was dead. He must have died in about, oh, let's see. He, he died. I actually talked to him a few hours before he died. I was in Paris at the time, and he was coming out of a meeting of the uh, – what was the FOCA at that time, the Formula One people. And uh, I was with uh, Max Mosley and a couple other people. I knew Max from Watkins Glen here and that. And uh, uh, But anyhow, Chapman was never very very accommodating to anybody. I mean, he, he really he almost thought you had to have a slot where you could put a quarter in and then he would talk to you or something. <laughs> but uh, years later, when Lola was first coming along and started to win all the races in, in England, I remember I asked him in, uh, at Sebring that year, what do you think about this Lola car? And uh, he said, oh, it's fly-by-night. They just built a couple cars, and they're not going to matter. They're not going to mean very much, which was interesting because a, a third friend that I went to school with at that time was a fellow by the name of Al Ross, who was my actually was my mechanic. And he wasn't a very good mechanic, but he was a good worker, which you really need at that point. And he imported the very first uh, Lola into the United States. I, he didn't tell me, in fact, until after it was well on the way. And I went with him, in fact, uh, when he cleared it through customs in Chicago. And uh, with the it was a it was a super car, but I always thought of what Chapman had said earlier that year when I talked to him about it. Frank was always very good about people, but he he re recognized he was working his way up in the pecking order of motorsport there, and uh, but he did very good. Well, he he impressed a lot of the journalists. I don't know, he got some really good write ups on his things and that, and uh, did very well with with that. But uh, it, was, it was an interesting time, and I started to say, when these cars came over, it seemed like Frank Nichols would always come over because he knew he'd get another order from me when he came over. And I would generally take that new car that I just got, which was like the Mark I that we ordered complete with an engine, and I would sell that car because I wanted the later one. And then 
I'd get the later one, and then I would sell that one because somebody else would buy it, and I would get the newer one all the time. But I did squeeze a few races in on some of them when they were new, and I was very fortunate, and it did pretty well. And the truth of the matter is the success of, of Elva was the fact that the people that got them were people that were willing to work on them, willing to learn how to set it up. Frank really delivered you a car that was complete in all the pieces, and they were all bolted together one way or another. But he, he didn't really do an awful lot. Uh, most of the guys that were driving Elvis in, in England even were guys that were doing all their own work and that. There were no big factory teams, as Hannah's just said. Uh, it brings back an instant later on after the Dixon era uh, when uh, we were going to run an actual uh, team at uh, Sebring, and Dixon arranged everything. He arranged the rooms for the cars and the mechanics and everything, and uh, I sold two of those cars to two people that each were going to drive them at Sebring and as part of the Lola team. Interesting, another interesting point, too. Frank was a really good uh, public relations man, too. Uh, from those first cars we bought, when he shipped them over here, they had our names in, on the doors, all written by a sign painter, really done nicely, which was kind of neat. You know, you really, you really thought that was nice. You might have liked to have done it, but in those days you probably wouldn't do that on your own. People would make a big issue. But when they came on an Elva with your name on them, generally was pretty nice. And if you got one that you didn't buy uh, uh, ahead of time, but you bought it from the dealer, you would also get somebody who's put their name on the same way because it was pretty common on the uh, Elvis at that time. But uh, getting back on, back to the, uh, uh, well, an instance, when they brought out the, I had a Mark II that I drove. I had a Mark III that I drove. Uh, I had a, one of the first Mark IVs. Generally, he would send Chuck and I the first cars that, that would come out there were, until he got Dixon involved, and then Dixon would get uh, the first cars there. But I got a Mark IV that year, and that was 1959, and I got it earlier in the year, I believe, because I raced it several times. Uh, actually, it's the one I sold to Bill Jordan at the time, it was a Sebring car. And uh, that Mark IV, when I saw it, I knew exactly where he got the design for it. Uh, if later any of you want to ask me, I brought a picture of an Abarth that I had, an Abarth 207. And uh, I had that, and when Frank first came over, he saw that car. And he really liked the looks of it. And that is where Frank got the idea for the knife edge on the... Uh, on the, on the bodies of the uh, Mark IV cars. And it so happened in 59 that those were the cars that we were going to race at uh, Sebring. And you could always tell those because they had an extra set of headlights built into the uh, bonnet of it. And uh, we picked up ours. Bill Jordan, I went with Bill Jordan and I and his wife, and we went to uh, Washington to pick up the Mark IV we were going to drive at Sebring. They were bringing down the other one that I had sold and one that was going to be driven by uh, Frank Batista, who was the national champion in G-Modified. was a very good Lotus driver, very good. And uh, uh, Arthur Tweedale was going to be the other one who worked for Dixon also. And uh, they were bringing those cars down. And we went to uh, uh, Dixon's place there in, in Washington, and, or Baltimore, I guess it was, and got the car in that. And we got down there, and first time we took the car out, it was it handled terrible. It was awful. And Frank was there, had arrived, and got down to Sebring. And a, guy that I, a fellow that I knew very well, who was a Lotus driver, who was very good mechanically, was down at Sebring, and he wanted to help us set up the car. And he was very good in setting up the front end of the car. But I always remember his name was J.C. Kilburn. He was from Rockford, later moved down to at Dallas, Texas, and that still races at, uh, uh, out at Monterey and that, in a junior, I guess, 
But anyhow, he told me that, uh, he said, you know, uh, oh, he, he said to Frank, Frank, how should, what, what kind of camber setting do you set up on the front end? And Frank said, how the hell should I know? I only make the cars. I don't <laughs> set them up. And that was typical of him. Listen, I'll skip on and come back a little later, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Sorry to take up your time. <laughs>